Welcome to OECD Podcasts, where policy meets people. How does the richest group of households in a country compare to the poorest? How can we expose the growing importance of the digital economy, often hidden in macroeconomic statistics? These two questions are the focus of today's episode. We'll be discussing the efforts being made to get data on these pressing issues as we explore the upcoming updates to the System of National Accounts, or the SNA, and two recently published OECD handbooks. One explores the distribution of income, consumption, and saving, while the other looks to improve our understanding of the digital economy in the National Accounts Framework, both vital pieces of work to inform policies that address these central economic challenges head on. Welcome to the second episode in our limited series on the OECD's National Accounts. If you haven't listened to the first one yet, now's the time. In the meantime, I'm Ashley Ward, and today I'll be joined by no less than three experts from the OECD's National Accounts Division. So strap in, because we're about to delve into the critical work ensuring that our national accounts remain reliable, comparable, and fit for purpose. In our previous conversation with Sophia Sachs-Ferrari and Philip Chan, we focused on the intricacies and trends in GDP and real household disposable income, touching only briefly on the SNA. But the upcoming 2025 update deserves its very own episode. And to kick off this discussion, I have Jurit Zweinenberg, the Head of National Accounts and Sectoral Accounts here at the OECD. Welcome, Jurit. Thank you very much, Ashley. Can you start off by giving our listeners a refresher to get them up to speed with the SNA, this international standard setter? The SNA is the statistical standard, the handbook that is applied by all countries around the world to compile their macroeconomic statistics. So this leads to comprehensive, coherent and internationally comparable data on important topics such as GDP and national income. The macroeconomic accounting standards, they are regularly updated to reflect changes in the economy. And the latest version dates back to 2008. And a lot has changed since then. So we are faced with increasing globalization, which is causing measurement problems for compilers. So it becomes increasingly difficult to derive national estimates with increasing amount of cross-border flows and corporations that have activities spread across many countries. We are also facing issues with increasing digitalization which may not always be visible in the results and for which it is not always clear if it's fully captured in the data. So this, for example, relates to the increasing role of data in business models and the increased use of cloud services and artificial intelligence by businesses. But it's also relating to the increased use of free apps by households, which is creating the data that is used by companies. There is also an increasing demand for data on well-being and sustainability, in addition to important measures such as GDP and household disposable income. And in that regard, users want more insights into how various aspects of the economy are affecting people's current and future well-being, as well as obtaining better insights in how economic activities may be affecting the environment. For this reason... An update process was launched in 2020 to develop additional guidance to tackle these various issues. 2008 is a long time ago. There's a lot that's happened in the last 17 years. This is a big update. And these updates don't happen on their own, right? So what does the work look like behind the scenes of this SNA update? I've been hearing about notes, task teams, and more over the past few years. Who has the OECD been working with and what does that collaboration look like for you? So looking at the whole update process, it is overseen by various international organizations involved in this work. So we are talking about the IMF, the World Bank, the United Nations, Eurostat, and the OECD. And they have created so-called task teams, including experts from all over the world, covering many statistical domains. And these have drafted guidance notes with specific recommendations on the issues we just discussed. These notes benefited from feedback from compilers and users all over the world and will now be included in the new SNA. Looking at the various topics, the OECD has been providing the Secretariat for the work in the area of well-being and sustainability, coordinating the work of various groups working on topics such as healthcare, education, natural capital, unpaid household activities and distributional national accounts, all to provide more insights into aspects affecting the well-being and sustainability of households. So at this point in time, all guidance notes have been finalized and subsequently the editors of the new SNA will start working on the various chapters and the new version of the SNA should be approved by the UN Statistical Committee next year. In the meantime, various task teams have also been established to start developing practical guidance to assist countries in implementing the new recommendations. So, for example, focusing on questions on how do you determine the value of data obtained via free apps? How do you determine the value of wind energy? 
And how do you obtain data on crypto assets as one of its main characteristics is that owners remain anonymous. So task teams recently started their work and it is expected that the compilation guidance should become available in the course of next year. And the OECD is leading the work on the compilation guidance for natural capital. Thanks, Jure. That was great. We'll come back to you later. So now I'm going to turn to our second guest, Bram Edens, head of the Environmental Economic Accounts and Supply Use Table section within the National Accounts. Welcome, Bram. Thanks for having me. It's my first podcast, actually. Well, hopefully this will be a nice introduction. So, Bram, you're also involved in the SNA update from SNA 2008 to SNA 2025. A lot's happened in those 17 years. So what would you consider to be the key areas that are being updated or added in this new manual? Yeah, so key areas are, first of all, well-being and sustainability, digitalization, and then also globalization. And each of these areas covers, in fact, multiple topics. For instance, the well-being and sustainability area covered a, a wide range of topics such as distributions of household income, consumption and wealth, the treatment of unpaid household service work, indicators of healthcare, as well as improving the measurement and treatment of of natural capital. And the digitalization task team covered issues such as the treatment of crypto assets, how to increase the visibility of digitalization in economic statistics, recording of data in the national accounts, improving the visibility of artificial intelligence, incorporating digital intermediation platforms, and also discussing uh, non-fungible tokens. NFTs. Thanks, Bram. Clearly lots of conceptual work being done in the digital space. Coming back to you, Jurit, and focusing on your new publication, the OECD Handbook on the Compilation of Household Distributional Results on Income, Consumption and Saving in line with national accounts totals. But for the sake of today's podcast, let's just call it the Handbook on Distributional Household Results. What would you say is the main objective and how does this work help to reveal inequalities and disparities in traditional indicators? First of all, sorry for the long title indeed. We are statisticians, we want to be comprehensive. So so maybe a title that covers all, but may not be the easiest to uh, to pronounce. So the main aim of the handbook is to assist compilers in the compilation of uh, good quality distributional results in line with national accounts totals. Of course, we already have a lot of distributional information available from micro statistics, but the results aligned to national accounts totals complement these results in various ways. One of the benefits is that these results provide a more comprehensive picture of economic inequality, including elements that may not be covered in microstatistics. So, for example, informal activities is an element that is captured in our results and normally not covered in microstatistics. A second aim of the handbook is that it provides users with a better understanding of the differences between the results that we are compiling and the results available from microstatistics. And in this regard, there is quite a lot of distributional information out there. For example, also relating to results by the World Inequality Lab, so linked to the work done by Piketty that many people will be familiar with. And having a handbook that explains to users what are the differences between these various types of distributional information is quite important for policy purposes. I think you've given our listeners a good idea of the motivation behind the handbook, but how about we elaborate a little bit now? So can you tell us a little bit more about the handbook and how it's been developed and what it covers? The handbook has been developed by our expert group on disparities in the national accounts framework, the EGDNA, which has worked on developing a standard collection template and guidelines for the compilation of these results. This expert group was jointly led by the OECD and Eurostat and included representatives from countries all over the world. And together with the group, we developed a specific methodology to compile the results consisting of linking micro data to national accounts totals and overcoming any gaps between those results. So, for example, related to items that may not be covered in micro data sources, but also relating to missing parts of the population. So, for example, the missing rich, rich people that are not covered in micro surveys uh, or under reporting by a specific group of households. And the handbook includes very detailed guidance on the various compilation steps and how countries can deal with the specific challenges in the compilation process. And in the meantime, the members of the group have also engaged in several compilation rounds and started to publish the results. And recently, we have also been including the results from the countries in our online databases. So you can now find this information in the online database basis of the OECD and also of Eurostat. So is this work done or is there more to do? What are the next steps? The publication of the handbook was a very important milestone for for the group, but we are still continuing the work. And in this regard, there is still quite a lot of work to do. So one of the goals that we are currently focusing on is to improve the granularity of the results. So having more detailed household groups 
So we are currently publishing at the quintile level. We want to move to the decile level and even having results for the top 1%, as this is very important for users. And we also would like to improve the timeliness of the results. So currently there is a significant delay in the results because survey data normally becomes available with a significant time lag. And we are now exploring now casting techniques to see if we can arrive at more timely estimates. And finally, we would also like to broaden the range of countries involved in the work, so covering more countries in our data sets. And in this regard, it is important to mention the G20 Data Gaps Initiative, which is an initiative among G20 economies to close specific statistical data gaps. And one of the main recommendations in the new data gaps initiative is to have more countries compile distributional results in line with national accounts totals. So this led to more countries that are now joining our group. So hopefully we will be able in the coming period, in the coming years, to have results for a broader range of countries. And I think also important to mention here in relation to the G20 Data Gaps Initiative is that we also launched a new expert group on the distribution of household wealth last year to develop a harmonized template and guidelines for the compilation of distributional wealth results to complement the work we have been doing so far on income, consumption and saving. So we are now working with the countries and we hope to have first experimental results in the area of wealth distribution by the end of this year. Thanks, Jure. That was great. And good luck with those next steps. Thank you very much. So now we're going to shift gears and dive into digitalization. But before that, I'm greeting our third and last guest for this episode, Lee Ng, who works as a statistician within the Environmental Economic Accounts team. Happy to have you, Lee. Thank you, Ashley. So digitalization is going to continue to be one of the main challenges faced by policymakers. Liam Bram, on the handbook on compiling digital supply use tables, how will it help to increase the visibility of the role of digitalization in our economy? Indeed, as we have all witnessed, the past decades have shown a complete transformation of economic activity and daily life through the application of all sorts of digital technology. Digitalization has fundamentally altered the production and consumption of goods and services worldwide over the past two decades. We used to buy Encyclopedia, now we have Wikipedia. There are now various digital intermediation platforms that have completely changed our traditional production chains, sometimes offering services for free. A concern has been that this digital transformation is largely hidden in core economic accounts. So to address these issues, we've started research on digitalization a couple of years ago, which eventually culminated in a handbook uh, with the catchy title, Handbook on Compiling Digital Supply and Use Tables. The development of the handbook was overseen by the OECD Informal Advisory Group on measuring a GDP in a digitalized economy. And the digital SUT handbook that we have uh, released last year complements the uh, handbook on measuring digital trade that was produced by the IMF, OECD, UNCTAD and WTO. And now we have this handbook. Are we completely clear on how we define the digital economy, what we think about when we think about the digital economy, or is there still work to do? Well, this may come as a surprise, but the handbook does not provide a single definition of the digital economy. Rather, digitalization is considered as a multidimensional phenomenon affecting the economy in different ways. For example, it may affect the way in which businesses produce goods and services, the specific products that may be produced, and the way in which these are ordered and delivered. It's difficult to capture all of this in a single number. Suppose we have two economies, one that produces a lot of ICT goods and services, but where all of these are still purchased in store, and another that does not produce any ICT products, but where more than half of the goods and services are ordered digitally. How would you compare these two countries in measuring the size of their digital economy? As they have been affected by digitalization in completely different ways, it may be more meaningful to show results on the different aspects of digitalization rather than capturing it in one number. Ram, your title of your handbook mentions digital supply use tables. Can you elaborate a little for our audience on what those are and how they compare to conventional supply use tables? So conventional supply and use tables describe economies in terms of where products are coming from. Have they been domestically produced and if so, by which industries or have they been imported? And who uses them? Are they used as an input for the production of other products or have they been used for final consumption or have they been exported? So these tables usually include very detailed information on the supply and use of goods and services broken down into multiple industries and products, providing users thereby with detailed information on the structure of the economy and the supply or value chain. So what the handbook does is basically to rearrange or restructure these conventional supply use tables by distinguishing several digital industries, 
such as digital intermediation platforms or e-tailers, as well as the uh, non-digital industries, by distinguishing several digital products, such as traditional ICT goods and services like computers and software, and also two products of considerable policy interest are shown separately, which are cloud computing services and digital intermediation services. And on top of that, uh, the digital supply and use tables also differentiate whether these products are ordered and or delivered digitally, directly via counterpart or via so-called digital platforms such as Uber or Amazon. Detailed information on digitalization means digital work on our side, but also probably detailed work on the countryside. So is this relatively straightforward for countries or is it a more detailed endeavor? Now it may be quite challenging for countries to develop the full digital supply and use tables with all these additional breakdowns, as not all data are readily available. Hence, the handbook suggests to start with the compilation of high-priority indicators, such as the amount of products that are digitally ordered or the value added by digital industries. The advantages of this approach are that it provides flexibility for countries to produce initial results which can help to improve international comparability, focuses on some of the most important outputs from a user perspective which are of policy relevance, and provides a more attainable goal for countries to aim for in the early stages of development. Several countries have produced estimates consistent with the framework such as Canada, the US, Sweden, Netherlands, Ireland and Korea. And several countries are looking into the compilation of first experimental results, mainly driven by high policy demand for this type of information. It's good to know that countries are really getting going on this work. We've talked a lot about the system of national accounts today in this episode. How does this handbook link together with the system of national accounts? Maybe we can close that loop. Definitely. So the new SNA will have a new chapter, 22, on digitalization, which discusses a range of topics such as the treatment of data as an asset, cloud computing, digital platforms. And this chapter will also make specific reference to and include the digital SUTs as a thematic account. In addition, there will also be updates to international industry and product classifications, which will better reflect digital uh, industries and products, and thereby also make it easier to better capture digitalization in economic statistics. We invite our audience to check out both of the handbooks, which are now available on the OECD website. And thank you all for coming. My pleasure. Thank you. For now, that completes our journey into the OECD's national accounts, from the upcoming SNA update to the two shiny new handbooks, and let's not forget about GDP and real household disposable income from our first episode. A special thanks to all our guests in this limited series for sharing their expertise. Join us next time for more insights on key OECD statistics and indicators to help make sense of today's pressing challenges. Until then, you can find us on X, formerly Twitter, or LinkedIn at OECD Statistics, or reach out to us via email at stat.contact.com at OECD.org. As always, stay curious and keep exploring the world of data.